Okay, good afternoon. Um, as I've been introduced, my name is Anthony Walker, and today I'm going to talk to you about mapping the hydropower resource of the Yangtze drainage basin in China. And for those who've eaten, you've got to stay to the very end, so that's compulsory. So China consumes a, a lot of energy and produces a lot of energy. It consumes a quarter of global primary energy and not surprisingly emits a quarter of all CO2 emissions. And that's the, the kind of negative picture of China. But it also generates a quarter of global renewable energy. It's the most hydropower resource rich country in the world. And it produces a fifth of its electricity generation is through hydropower. So it's doing a lot for renewables and is a global leader. The Yangtze River itself covers a catchment area of a fifth of China, and China's about 10 million kilometers squared. It's the longest river in Asia, at 6,300 kilometers long. It's the third longest river in the world. It discharges 33,000 meters cubed per second, and that's the fourth most powerful river in the world, and flows from the high on the Qinghai Plateau, which is basically bordering Tibet, down to the East China Sea and has mountain peaks over 6,400 metres, so it's a very mountainous terrain, ideal for hydropower. So the project that we've been trying to do is to model the um, hydrology of the Yangtze drainage basin, which we'll then use to search for hydropower locations. So when it comes to modelling the hydrology, there are three components that are important. One being the terrain, um, you've got to basically digitise the terrain and the river network. You've got to take meteorology data dating back, we've gone back to the 70s for a long time series of meteorology of temperature and precipitation. And then we stitch that together with a, a flow model and how that runs through across the terrain and how the water flows. And we're, So when it comes to modelling the terrain, they, we use a, what they call a digital elevation model. And there are many models available, um, some local to the UK and some global. So we've used a global model um, that is uh, satellite derived. And we've used something called hydrosheds. And the reason why hydrosheds is attractive is it, it's become, it's been hydrologically conditioned, um, which, which is, is, is great for ma mapping hydrology. And as you can see, there's a map of Asia there. And the China sits in, in that portion of it. So that's the bit we're interested in. And somewhere within that is the Yangtze drainage basin. So using that digital elevation model, we can then establish how water flows across the landscape. And we've assumed a basic assumption that water flows in the steepest downhill direction in one of eight directions. And from that, we can get a flow direction model. And from that, we can then get a river map because water eventually accumulates in, 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 in kind of catchment areas and we can get a river map. And from that view, it looks like the whole of Asia is covered in rivers, um, which it pretty much is. But when we look closely, and we look at the mouth of the Yangtze, you can see a much more normal river map is what we'd expect. And using that river map, we can go from um, the source of the Yangtze and work backwards and find the Yangtze drainage basin. So that red dot is the source of the, so the mouth of the Yangtze. Um, and we know it's the mouth because A, there's a big estuary there. And secondly, the accumulation of water at that point is huge. So working back, we can find all the, all the cells that eventually drain into that area and we can find the Yangtze drainage basin, which is this dragon shaped um, in the bottom southeast corner of China. As I said before, it's approximately about a fifth of China. So now we have the drainage basin, we can use that as a, almost like a biscuit cutter and cut other data, sh data sets from it. And that's looking uh, a zoomed up view of the drainage basin alone with a river network uh, pasted over it. And these are just the large rivers. The Yangtze itself 
starts up here, comes down through Yunnan, Sichuan, and then that's around Nanjing, and then Shanghai, somewhere here, and then it flows out to the East China Sea. But there's so many much more smaller rivers, which are also very attractive when it comes to looking for small hydropower. And using Google Maps, you can just see, again, where it starts, Hu Chongqing, Wuhan, and the three gorges, see something down there, and eventually out near Shanghai. So now we model the terrain, we need to model the meteorology. So again, there's many meteorological data sets that are available. And um, we've used something called um, Aphrodite, which is a Japanese resource. It's attractive because it's quite high resolution and it dates back to the 60s and 70s. So we can have a long time series. And we're interested in precipitation, rainfall obviously, and snowfall. Temperature, how hot it is, because that has an influence on snow melt and how much evaporates. And that contributes to evapotranspiration, um, which is water lost back to the atmosphere before it reaches the outlet of the sea. The evapotranspiration, there isn't an evapotranspiration data set, as far as we know, going back to the 70s on a daily scale. So we created our own using um, MERA data, which is a NASA data set. Um, and lots of things are thrown together to form the evapotranspiration record. And that all fits together in the model. So we have daily files for each of these uh, meteorological sets that eventually contribute into the model. Now looking at precipitation um, for, uh, for the Yangtze, you can see that winters are very dry, with a little bit of rain in this southeast corner. Summers are much wetter. Again, a lot of rain more in the southeast. The, the high plateau is still quite dry. And the annual mean, again, shows that the southeast corner is particularly wet. And you can see over the record, we've gone back to 1979, that annual flows you know, are, are varied, as you'd expect. Sometimes you have wet, wet years and dry years. But overall, there's no significant trend, as far as I can see. Um, you can have some very, very big flood years, um, but there's no significant trend in rainfall if you look at the Yangtze drainage basin as a whole. But um, that, that, there might be regional changes due to climate change, but uh, as a whole, there's no significant change. When it comes to temperature, again, you have cold winters, particularly up here on the plateau, with a mean of 1.6 degrees C, um, and this is over the 30-year record. A summer mean of hot summers, particularly down in this middle region and on the eastern edge of the catchment, and an average of 11.7. Now, if you look at the temperature record over the 30 years, even in that time, I'd say there's a significant shift of temperature you know there's definitely rising temperatures as a, if you look at the Yangtze as a whole um, which could easily mean that in the future snow melt is affected which could affect the summer flows uh, and winter flows and the evapotranspiration record could increase therefore you're losing water more to the atmosphere so this could have an impact on long-term hydropower resource so we stitch all this together um, in, a, in a model. Um, we've used something that was developed by the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Um, it's called Grid to Grid. And we basically look at the precipitation, the evapotranspiration, and we have um, a certain amount that can go into the, into the soil. And if that exceeds, then that runs off to the next cell. And we've stitched all this together using a programming language called R and a bit of C++. And we, we represented the Yangtze uh, catchment with about 200 million cells. So every few minutes, we're simulating how water would flow over that landscape. So we've been recently been testing the model. And we've started with a small catchment, which is called Laoguanhe. 
which is up in the upper north central part of the catchment. And that is alone, it's 3,000 kilometres squared. Uh, the problem with mapping um, such a large area, such as the Yangtze, is we basically come to the limit of computing power. It just takes so long to kind of produce it. So we're testing on a small catchment for now, and others. And this is the model in action. It's simulating flows. That's a, a snapshot from January, and there's a snapshot from July. It shows the flows, uh, the, the river's ebb and flow, um, and from that we can extract daily data. So this is a, a, a test of 19, um, 1980, um, one year, and you can see the red is the modelled flows, and green is calibration data, which we've got from actually a, a German institute. Um, and you can see there's a, a reasonable match uh, between uh, model and calibration. However, we've got, this has only been derived by lots and lots of permutations because there's lots of parameters that are unknown. So you've got to run the model, you know, ten, hundreds, thousands of times to try and get some figures that make sense. Now, what we're interested in for hydropower is what they call a flow duration curve, where this, these, this on the bottom axis is a percentile. So the 100th percentiles, you get some very, very high floods. And down here, you get some very, very low flows. Um, so that's a percentile of time. And that's what we used for hydropower mapping. And we've assumed that this data is for the catchment outlet. And we've assumed that going backwards, it still holds for the smaller parts of that catchment upstream. So you can see that's for one year. And then we run it over maybe 15 years using the best parameter set and it's even it's, it's almost slightly stronger. And the way we've checked that, it, to get the best results, is A, visual, um, but mainly using objective functions. Um, so uh, we're, we're quite happy with that hydrology, um, and we'll use that to go forward to search for hydropower. And that's just the, a long time series um, that we've used to generate these raster maps, and a raster is like a grid of cells basically, and uh, this represents the 100th percentile flow where you can see you get 1500 meters cubed per second on the Laogon, that's huge, to the low flows where you're getting literally about 50 liters a second at the catchment outlet, and they're the big rivers down the center. And that's what we use to go into the hydropower search. So, now we're in the position where we're developing an algorithm to search for hydropower. And basically, hydropower consists of an intake, a turbine, a powerhouse basically, some sort of pipe that connects the two, we call a penstock, and then there might be canals. And what we're looking to do is, is find a good design that's cost effective. So we iterate, we, 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 we say, well, let's put an intake there, let's put a turbine there, Let's iterate the design flow, which is the maximum flow the, the system can take, the turbine types, the configurations, the intake, uh, and um, uh, discharge location. And there's other, other permutations. We're looking to cost to find a good rate of return, because basically renewable projects don't get funded unless you get some economic payback, usually. And then maybe later on we'll investigate the climate change risk. So I've chosen a couple of points high up on my river map. And mapping those on Google Maps, you can see an intake there, that's just a random point, and a discharge point there, again, random. It might be better to actually put a, a discharge point there, so you're not paying as much for your pen stock and pipe work, etc. So, I won't go through all these figures, but basically, if you design it for the very high flows, that could be classed as small hydropower, which actually is quite big, 16 megawatt. But unfortunately, even though you get some very, very high flows at the, at the uh, high percentile, they only last for, you only get that once in a 30 years or something like that. Whereas if you design for the low flows, you get, it, you get that minimum flow all the time, but at best, you'll just get a very, very small amount of power. I call these femto. Um, I don't think there is femto hydropower, but just to say that 
Um, these are, I'm not even interested in these. So we're looking for schemes that are either large, small, micro, or pico. And um, pico hydropower is about 0.5 kilowatt to uh, 5 kilowatt. Micro hydropower is 5 to about 100 kilowatt. And small is up to about 50 megawatt, depends in which country you're in. And then large, you know, you get some very, very large power stations like the Yangtze Gorges is, um, the Three Gorges Dam is about 22 gigawatt. It's huge. So, so looking a bit further, the algorithm then draws a, a basically a turbine map and it looks for appropriate turbines so that could use that power and that head because it's the height difference that's also very important when it comes to hydropower. And it comes up with permutations. So for example, on this one, on this particular site, it found 175 different configurations that could be appropriate. And some examples are some very, very high flows that could use a Francis turbine. It delivers quite a lot of energy, actually, over that time period, even if it lasts for a short period of time. And it could power up to 2,500 homes in the UK. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and it should be the way around, sorry. Um, but basically, uh, so it, these could be quite a good project, but they only would be operate for about 2.5% of the time. So therefore, are they cost effective? And that's the stage we're at now to, to decide if these projects are cost effective. I'd imagine these aren't. Whereas you could go to the other end, you could get um, a low flow um, system, and could use a Pelton turbine. At best, it would generate about five megawatt hours per year, which could power maybe one Chinese home, or one UK home, or three Chinese homes, uh, based on current usage. But it operates for 77% of the time. So that could be cost effective. And that's what we were trying to do, not just look for the high energy deliveries, but look for things that um, are cost effective. And we have tools using um, Red Screen, which is a Canadian model, to, to cost these projects. And that's the stage we're at now to look for economic projects. So, to conclude, we've developed a hydrological model of the Yangtze, which is calibrating well with good results compared to objective functions and visually. We need to verify these across larger subcatchments, which we're doing now. Um, we, uh, uh, the, the outputs are good flow du duration curves, which are, are used for the hydropower search. And we're developing the hydropower search and costing algorithm as we speak. So, um, and importantly, all this uses international and public data, which uh, is, is useful because actually these tools could then be employed across other catchments in the world. So effectively, the Yanks is a test base, a big test base, probably one of the biggest, um, but it could be used elsewhere in other countries. Um, just to say, I didn't mention at the beginning that the project's in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Tom Bruce, um, from Energy Systems, Gareth Harrison and Clive Grated, who's in physics. Um, and if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try and answer. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.